Kentucky Ancestors is brought to you with support from the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation. Today on Kentucky Ancestors, our researchers attempt to unravel a complex family story of divided sympathies and smuggling along the Mississippi River during the Civil War. Our family mystery comes to us from Hickman in Fulton County in far western Kentucky. Join us as we reveal the details and special research methods that family history experts and the Kentucky Historical Society use to document this story. Kentucky Ancestors starts now. Welcome to Kentucky Ancestors, presented by the Kentucky Historical Society. I'm your host, Heather French Henry. Join our studio audience and talented family history research team as we reveal Kentucky's deep and diverse roots, one family at a time. In today's show, we travel to the farthest corner of western Kentucky. Our story begins in the town of Hickman in Fulton County along the Mississippi River. One of our viewers, Alice Bratcher, asked us to verify the truth behind a story that seemed to include her great-great-grandfather's ferry boat that crossed the river between Hickman and Durena, Missouri. Welcome to the show, Alice. How thank are you. you? Very good, thank you. Well, tell us a little more about your story. Well, I, I uh, want to document about the ferry. Uh, he had it from 1842 to 1873, and then his four, uh, three sons and a daughter uh, got the okay to have it for 20 more years. Okay. So I... Uh, so does your family help you? I know you've brought some family and friends with you today. Are they a part of... They work on some genealogy, yeah, but not, nice. not on, on my line. I do most of it, yeah. Oh, okay. So is this a passion for you then? Yeah, since I was 18. Oh, my goodness. So you started early on. Well, good for you. Well, your family story is very interesting. Not that everyone's family isn't interesting, <laughs> but you've got some really dicey things going on in this little story here. So Alice's, your family story connects to an article written actually in 1984. So we're gonna dive a little bit further back because of that story. So the author detailed the intrigue and deception behind a network of Confederate sympathizers during the Civil War who smuggled quinine further into the South. So little smugglers in her family, <laughs> right? Did this network of smugglers involve Alice's family? Well, we're gonna find that out. So this article hinted at that very thing. So from America's earliest days until the mid 20th century, quinine was a medicine used to treat malaria, often transmitted by mosquitoes. It was extremely important to both civilians and soldiers, of course, in the South. So the article suggests that many Southerners considered it an honor to help their troops by smuggling quinine and other medicines. And they could actually be pretty creative in how they <laughs> transported quinine across the enemy lines, ladies and gentlemen. Very interesting, including like sewing it inside a child's doll or inside the hoop of a girl's or a woman's skirt, right? So interesting ways they would smuggle things. Well, the article's author, Noma Dix Winston, related the story of her ancestor, Sally King, so Miss Sally, as she was known, had negotiated with a Union captain stationed in Hickman to retrieve the body of her son from the Missouri side of the river after he was killed in action. So despite the body coming from behind enemy lines, the captain actually agreed to honor the grieving mother's wishes. So that's a pretty nice little thing to do. Well, the day of the transfer, as Miss Sally wept for her dead son, the United States troops searched the coffin for a false bottom, found nothing. A graveside service was performed. The body was buried as usual. And for a week, for a week, the Union soldiers actually kept their eyes on this gravesite because of smuggling issues. I had no idea about that. So, so they didn't fully trust Miss Sally, but as time passed, they left the grave to attend to other matters. And according to the article though, 
As soon as the soldiers left, Sally and another man dug up the body, actually. Miss Sally went and dug up a body to retrieve a packet of quinine about the size of a man's hand. And it actually was hidden in the corpse clothes. Alice. It was hidden in the corpse clothes inside a watertight silk pouch taped to his back. Okay, now let's just talk about Miss Sally. <laughs> <laughs> so, what? How do you feel about this story? Well, I, it's part of my family. <laughs> <laughs> we all wish we had something, you know, so delightful to tell. So, can you read a section yes. um, from the article? The odd thing about this story is that after the war, Miss Sally's husband and three sons all came home. Who was the man buried in the King family grave plot? No one knows. He was one of the unknown Confederate dead. Until the day she died, Miss Sally always called him her spiritual son. All right, Miss Alice. So let's talk about Miss <laughs> Sally. So her three sons came home, and so she was a part of this smuggling ring. And to this day, no one knows who that soldier is. If I, find the, if I could find the bones, I might have them dug up and have them tested. <laughs> so you do get a trait of Miss Sally down <laughs> in your generational lines. So that is an amazing story. So let's t then talk about the ferry. So do you know which ferry was running at that time between Hickman, Kentucky and Durant, Missouri? My, my second great grandfather, John Boyer, the Bear, Boyer Ferry. He had it from 1842 to 1873. Okay, so known locally as Boyer's Ferry, yes. John Boyer actually owned and operated um, this extremely important mode of transportation, you're exactly correct, that served the Hickman area for more than 30 years, uh, beginning around 1842 until his death in 1873 during the yellow fever outbreak. So before we take our first commercial break, let's visit Fulton County. Our film crew interviewed the current captain of the ferry boat that still runs between oh, Hickman good. and Missouri. Yes, and then we will travel just 30 minutes north to Columbus Belmont State Park to learn how the Civil War affected Western Kentucky. I've been working on the ferry since 2009, and then I got my license in 2011 and been running it ever since. Yeah, we see quite a few barges, you know, up and down the river. And we get a lot of tourists, a lot of farm equipment. Yeah, there are lots of large farms in the three you know, surrounding states. Since 2009, it's been ran by the Mississippi County Port Authority. To my knowledge, back 1900, the Lattices used it for their personal farm use, and then he collected fares from, you know, people needing to get to Kentucky and Missouri, you know, just like we do now. And I learned that the John Boyer, I believe it was, owned it and ran it for several years before that. And that's the earliest history I know of. As a kid, you know, I've been up to Columbus, Belmont State Park. I've always heard about the chain. They stretched across the Mississippi to stop traffic from getting any farther south. The Confederates moved in from Tennessee and they took this place simply because of the bluffs here. They quickly moved the chain from Fort Pillow, which is just north of Memphis, and brought it up here because this was a more strategic point to block the river. General Leonidas Polk is in charge of Fort de Russy. It is an earthen fort. The river does not look anything today like it did in 1861. In 1861, there was a, a huge bend just north of here where the river flowed west. If you look up the river today, you're looking up seven miles. As the Union gunboats would come down the river, for them to get caught on the chain of the 140 guns that could shoot from one to three miles, they would easily take them out. The Confederates are only here from September of 61 to March of 62. Uh, General Grant was stationed at Cairo. Grant decided to attack across the river at Camp Johnston. It was a lookout post. Grant was successful in taking the, the, the camp, but the 140 guns could reach the camp. He had to make a hasty retreat, go back to his gunboats for around the bend. But Grant, after he had attacked over here and had lost the battle, and he knew that Columbus was known as a Gibraltar of the West, and it, he felt that it could not be taken without a tremendous amount of loss of life. So he chose to go up the Tennessee and the Cumberland Rivers and take out Force Henry and Fort Donaldson. 
he had the ability to get on the supply line and cut this place off and cause it to, to fall like Vicksburg did uh, about a year and a half later. It's 160 acres. We have a 38 site campground. We are a part of Kentucky State Parks. We also, of course, have this museum that you're seeing today. It uh, tells the history of this site as well as the history of the Civil War. Our opening day is the last weekend of April, open daily, and then we open up our snack bar, museum, golf, but we do keep our campground open year round as well as our conference center. Hello, I'm Doug High, the director of the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation. We're a nonprofit organization that was created to support the Kentucky Historical Society and its mission to preserve and educate our shared Kentucky history in order to better meet the challenges of the future. And we do this through major gifts, grants, and endowments from groups and people just like you. Please consider a donation to the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation or by simply becoming a member at KHS. Welcome back to Kentucky Ancestors. Before the break, we learned about the ferry that still crosses the Mississippi River between Fulton County and Missouri. And so, um, Alice, when we were watching that video during break, you actually said you've been on that ferry. Yes, and I know that gentleman. I talked to that gentleman, yeah. Oh, very nice. Well, I grew up in a, the land of a ferry as well called the Jenny Ann that crosses the Ohio River um, over to Ohio from Augusta. So I love that. And that's also, though, where your family mystery involves smuggling during the Civil War kind of takes place. So we're going to dig a little more into that story. So the original ferry on that same site, operated by John Boyer, appears to have carried wagons, people, horses, and other livestock, and that certainly makes sense. That's how ferries are kind of still run today, although that one's a little larger than the one where I'm from. So according to Fulton County Court Records, John renewed the ferry rights periodically at the county courthouse. These records describe the location of the ferry as being one mile south of town, right? So that yes. makes sense. This location uh, makes perfect sense when viewing where Hickman sits in relation to the river route over to Durena, Missouri. But that's as close as we can get because the ferry itself couldn't be found on any historic maps, oddly enough. So as we heard in the video, the location of the banks of the Mississippi River have fluctuated certainly over the years. But we have evidence that John had a very lucrative business. If uh, this newspaper article advertisement is any indication, so I'm going to have you read a piece of that advertisement. Boyer's Ferry, we can cross you over in 10 minutes. A special low rates for local trade to Hickman. Well, look at that. Time sensitive. I mean, he was really <laughs> crushing the business right there, I guess. When the Civil War broke out, John Boyer tried his best to keep running his ferry despite tumultuous conditions, as you can imagine, caused by the war. The Hickman region was a scene of a ton of action uh, during the conflict, and both sides fought to gain control of that strategic location. And in fact, control of Hickman switched sides at least a couple of times during the war, right? So your sympathies, I think, would go back and forth. So Alice, next down on your sheet, can you read this notice by Union General Ulysses S. Grant about the conditions of the area near Paducah and Hickman in 1861? To the citizens of Paducah, I have come among you not as an enemy, but as your friend and fellow citizen. An enemy in rebellion against our common government has taken possession of and planted its guns upon the soil of Kentucky and fired upon our flag. Hickman and Columbus are in his hands. I am here to defend you against this enemy and to assert and maintain the authority and sovereignty of your government and mine. Well said, right? <laughs> so by 1863, the Union Army confiscated John Boyer's ferry and took it further north to Columbus in Hickman County. A letter written by one of John's descendants, uh, Nanny Boyer Rice, shares this story. So will you read the items that were confiscated? One ferry boat, 1,200 bushels of corn, 75 bushels of potatoes, 10 head of horses, 10 or 15 stands of bees, and everything else they could see. 
Right? So I love the whole list, right? The stands of bees are great, <laughs> the other, but the everything else they could see. So I'm going to use that the next time my husband asks me what I bought at the store. And I'm just going to rattle down a list and I said, then everything else they could see. <laughs> so on July 30th of that same year, John Boyer wrote a letter from Hickman to a union officer at the fort in Columbus who was in charge of the area. Now, Alice, can you read what John claims? I am the owner of the horse ferry boat now at Columbus and a loyal citizen of the United States. My ferry boat was seized shortly after the withdrawal of the troops from this place. I shall be glad if you will give an order to me for its restoration, pledging myself that it shall be used for no improper or illegal purposes, whatever, as it never was heretofore. Interesting. Interesting response. So there is no record of activity from John Boyer about the ferry actually from 1863 to 1866. So it actually appears that the U.S. Army um, held his boat for most of the war. Uh, but to show how complex and confusing life in Kentucky was during this time, John remained in Hickman despite its shifting loyalties right back and forth in April of 1864 when U.S. forces were once again attempting to clear out the Confederates, one Union officer charged with evacuating loyal citizens from the city stated, I would say that there are very few loyal citizens in Hickman. <laughs> the place is decidedly rebel. So, as John Boyer was still residing in Hickman at the time this statement was made, it was really difficult to tell which side John truly supported, right? So depending yes. on like who had control. So again, this was not an unusual problem for this time period when people were living in a place that was literally occupied by the South one day and then by the North the next, right? Because you were gonna be sympathetic to whoever was in control just to save your life. So to complicate John's story further, in 1860, he married a woman named America Fleetwood. I actually love that name, America Fleetwood, whose family had known Confederate uh, sympathies, of course. Just after the conclusion of the war, John and America's last child was named Robert Lee Boyer, perhaps in honor of the famous Confederate general, Robert E. Lee. So it appears he may have had some sympathies to one side. But let's take a moment and go back to the historic account where we examined at the beginning of the show, written by Noma Winston, about quinine smuggling. So our genealogy experts dissected the article that got Alice started on her family history. So Noma's article contains clues as to both true and not so true details. Here's KHS's head of library and archives, Sherry Daniels, to explain why this step is important and how you can dissect your own family stories prior to planning out your own research. Most genealogists know that a family story can be one of the best clues we have to take our research in a certain direction. But what should you do when you encounter a family story? It's always important to document the story itself. Write it down exactly as you heard it. Or better yet, take an audio recording of your family member relating the story to you. Future generations will thank you for capturing the sound of an ancestor's voice. Then take the story you gathered and dissect it for research clues. Does the story give you a history timestamp to start with, such as date, location, names of those involved? Does it have details that can be corroborated through outside documentation? You need to attempt a research verification of the story. That way, when you pass it down to the next generation, you can either enhance it with documented validation or an alternate storyline based on the research. Keep in mind that family stories can resemble the telephone game we used to play as children. By the time the story gets to you, it may have passed through many generations and shifted versions multiple times. This alteration over time can happen by accident or intentionally in an attempt to protect the reputation of loved ones. If you discover that your family story cannot be validated through research, or worse yet, that the story just doesn't add up in the documentation, it's still important to record the story anyway. Why? Because your family chose to include this story as part of their family narrative, it is a piece of your family's identity that was important enough to pass on to subsequent generations. Besides, future generations may stumble upon the correct details that make the essence of the story true. Pass on what your research revealed along with the original version. For 
Before the break, we explore the complexities of Alice's ancestors' life along the Mississippi River during the Civil War. So Alice, your curiosity and questions about your family history were sparked by the article written by Noma Winston mm -hmm. that we examined at the beginning of the show. Very interesting story. After taking a closer look at Noma's original article and family story, our researchers were immediately struck by the overall probable truth of her account and then became concerned with some of the problematic individual details, which can certainly happen. For instance, while details about the smuggling family were presented with great clarity, some of the logistical details seem to confuse a path to the truth, although still making for a great story. The most troubling portion of Sally Keene's narrative, as told by Noma, is the description of Sally's stately home overlooking the Mississippi River. So supposedly that's near Hickman. It states that Sally signals smugglers across the river by placing a candle in her attic window, but to signal smugglers on the Arkansas side of the river. <laughs> so again, you know, we talk about the clarity of things. So the problem with this description is geography, as we certainly look at the map. When looking at maps of the area from both today and during the Civil War, the lower tip of Missouri prevents anyone in Kentucky from seeing, let alone signaling, anyone in Arkansas, unless they had a cell phone at the time. And I don't think they had that during that time. Well, the location details were not the only problems, of course, in Noma's article. She named several individuals throughout the story, such as General Kirby, her great-great-grandfather, Captain John King, her great-great-grandmother, Sally King, and her great-grandfather, Andrew King, who supposedly supplied the false identity of the dead soldier. So as for General Kirby, we couldn't locate any Confederate general with that surname. But we did find Confederate General Edmund Kirby Smith, who oversaw the Trans-Mississippi Department. This places him in the right area, including both Missouri and Arkansas, but with a slightly different name, which again, happens over time. As for Noma's great-great-grandparents and great-grandfather, unfortunately our research couldn't find any such people in her family tree with those names. Instead, we found a great-great-grandfather, John Luttrell, who had a sister named Sally and a great-grandfather named Andrew. So, Alice, sometimes these names seem similar, you know, to the article, but not quite correct. So what do you think about Noma's family tree at the, this point? You can, it's like you, you can call somebody grandmothers and you never hear their real name. So that's how you can get things mixed up on names. Certainly in different documents and how people spell and how, you know, when they write things down, it just, they're, those offer those complexities, right? In research that we're now doing. Um, and so, when we think about Noma, was she telling sort of a whopper of a tale? Um, it's a great tale, right? But we'll find out after our final commercial break. Welcome back to Kentucky Ancestors. If you're just joining us, our guest Alice submitted a family mystery that involves smuggling medicine across the Mississippi River during the Civil War. Our historians and genealogy experts have explained the evidence and found some questionable content in the article written by Noma Winston that originally sparked Alice's curiosity. So was this article completely untrue? Here are our findings. Noma's mother was a Luttrell by birth and her maternal grandmother had the surname of King. But that's as far as the similarities actually go. So our genealogy expert Sherry explained in the video that proper research, these complex family stories can actually take on a life of their own and end up being passed on to future generations, as she mentioned, like a bad game of telephone, right? The different versions of the truth. So we're not sure who actually smuggled the quinine further south, nor whose ferry was used. Noma's family branches stretch from Tennessee all the way up to the Ohio River near Henderson. So who was the smuggler in Noma's family, right? Noma wrote down the story as told to her. And then on the story's way to Noma's ears, someone else then got the details wrong. But it's more than likely that the essence of the story is still true. Besides, for an activity that was so steeped in secrecy in order to avoid capture, 
How many details may have been lost or erased actually on purpose, actually to save people? As with many family stories sometimes, we actually may never you know, know that truth, certainly. And that is, have you come across that from time to time in your research? Yeah, yeah add on. Yeah. They add on, right? Right, exactly. Um, but earlier, you read a portion of an ad placed in the Hickman Courier by your ancestor, yes. John Boyer, to promote his services, actually. And here's um, a look at the particular ad. So can you read to us again where he offered a ferry, uh, offered to ferry people? To Missouri, Arkansas, and Texas. So Alice, will you please note the last name of the competent and attentive manager listed in a second ad that we discovered? Mr. C. W. Fleetwood. Hmm, so does that name sound vaguely yeah. familiar? Relative, relative. Right, so possibly a relative of America Fleetwood, my new favorite name, love that. We believe the manager to be Charles W. Fleetwood, the brother of John's wife, America. So perhaps John Boyer's Ferry was more connected to the story than Noma's article actually let on. Um, this newspaper ad was posted in 1874, the year after John Boyer's death of yellow fever, which incidentally is also a mosquito-borne illness, right? So how do you feel about that conclusion? Well, that's a big conclusion, yeah, that's very good. It is interesting. So on the Fleetwood side, had you discovered much about? Well, n no, not too much. Uh it's another one I'm working on, but I, I know Fleetwood uh, was a guardian for my great-grandmother and her brother, okay. Robert Lee Boyer. So how do you feel about um, that story of Sally King and the smuggling? Um, are you going to keep this sort of quasi a part of your family <laughs> story, maybe say it or, you know, disclose it at Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good story to have, yeah. And then, have details later on too, more facts. Absolutely, certainly. Thank you so much, Alice. We certainly <laughs> appreciate you being here today and joining us, and it just is a, a treasure to learn all of these minute little details of family history, correct? Yeah, I th I'm wondering if maybe my uh, second great-grandfather named his uh, last son Robert Lee Boyer because the Union Army hadn't reimbursed him for his uh, uh, ferry. A little payback, huh, <laughs> you think? Maybe, we'll have to look into that. We'll do another show maybe on that one. <laughs> well, join us next month on Kentucky Ancestors as we race to discover one family's connection to the first Kentucky Derby winner. For the Kentucky Historical Society, I'm Heather French-Henry.